Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I'm your host, Sandy Rosenthal, and this is another great episode of Beat the Big Guys. Today, my guest is right here from New Orleans. His name is Dan Schneider. Hey, Dan. Hey, how you doing, Sandy? Good to meet you. Oh, Go thank you so much. I hope I hope I wasn't offensive. You're actually not from the city of New Orleans, are you? Is that right? Oh, I'm from a suburb. I originally okay. from St. Bernard, if you've seen the pharmacist show, that's where okay. most of my work was done. Of course, my son was murdered in New, in New Orleans, okay? So we have a tie to that, and I did a lot of work there. Uh, but I now live in Mandeville. After okay. Katrina, we moved to Mandeville, to the North Shore, uh, to get away from the chances of the hurricane a little more so. Well, I, that will help. That will help. And so you don't mind that I that I um, said you're from New Orleans, that you don't mind that? Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> you know, when you say you're from Mandeville, uh, around the country, I, I've been speaking now around the country at various locations. And, you know, it just doesn't make sense to say you're from Mandeville. Everybody knows New Orleans and pretty much loves New Orleans, even with all its faults. Well, um, I think I would agree with you. And Mandeville is a really beautiful city. So, Dan, a lot of our listeners are not familiar with the pharmacist. Or some of them might not be. Uh, so I'd like to tell them a little bit about what you've been doing and then turn the mic over to you. Sounds good. OK. Um, Dan Schneider believes that sharing his hard found wisdom will benefit others. He married his high school sweetheart, Annie, in 1970. She worked and he went to school and worked part time. Dan became a pharmacist in 1975 and she became a stay at home mom. Their son, Danny, was born September 27, 1976. Little Danny was a blonde haired, blue eyed, beautiful boy. They say he brought them much joy. Their daughter, Christy, came along in 1980 and completed what many called the Griswold family, station wagon, family trips, and a 17-foot high Christmas tree. I love it. Then, on, on April 14th, 1999, their wonderful life changed. Their son was murdered while attempting to buy drugs. He had been a polite kid, compassionate, peaceful, no fights, no detentions. The only drug issue was he occasionally smoked pot, or so they thought. They were shocked, devastated, ashamed, and blamed themselves for a while. After briefly doubting and being angry with God, they became closer to their faith than ever. Dan had to go find his son's killer. He asked God for help and protection for himself and the witness to his son's murder. He promised God that if he could get the killer off the street, Dan would educate parents, youth, and do anything to reduce the drug and addiction problem and prevent tragedies such as happened to his family. Their story is told in the Netflix docuseries, The Pharmacist. But their story is not over. It is still being written as Dan strives to build a nationwide movement to end the opioid and addiction pandemic that has killed nearly a million since their son died. Dan, you have something that's called unprecedented and unparalleled moral authority. I appreciate that. And, and, uh, and you're still using it, and you're using that authority for the greater good. Thank you so much. We are definitely trying, that's for sure. And uh, I'm glad that you mentioned the Griswolds, though, because on a lighter note, okay, we we had a great family, okay? We really did. Uh, I had so as a child, but also met my childhood sweetheart, so to speak, uh, and had our, our two children, and we had the nice house, and I was a pharmacist, made pretty good money, had nice cars. I mean, life was just rolling along, okay? I mean, I know everybody's got a little little dips and ups and downs and whatnot and things that maybe used to bother us. Okay. But when I look back on it, it was a picturesque life. And, this, and we, we had a tourist station wagon. We toured the country and just like, just like the show was, you know, the kids would be in the back aggravated listening to our music and such. And did you and really have a 17 foot high Christmas tree? Yes, we did. And it was really <laughs> funny because our front door was just a regular standard front door. So we could not bring the tree in opened up. We'd have to keep it bundled, bring it in, stand it up, and then open it up. And just like in the Chevy Chase movie, when you would unclip it, 
okay, with the scissors, it would fall open and it literally would hit the walls. Okay. And then actually we tried to make sure it didn't knock anything over, but it, 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 it filled up. Uh, we had a, uh, we did have a big den. Okay. But it's still, it, 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 it was really something. And then, you know, sad to say April 13th, actually, and my son was pronounced dead at 12.08 AM on the 14th. So technically speaking, he did die on the 14th. That's his date of death. Okay. He may have been dead actually on the 13th. Okay. He went out the night of the 13th. So both of those dates are really embedded in our minds and our life changed uh, just briefly to get people an idea of what went on. You know, uh, our son had told us he was going out to get some notes. He was, he was, he was dating. He was working. He was going to uh, college, told us he was going out for some notes and, uh, and uh, he left the house at about maybe 10 30 at night. And all of a sudden at, uh, uh about two o'clock in the morning, we were asleep. We assumed that he had came back. The, the good news was when he left, he, he came and told us as we leave. We said, the, 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 you know, be careful. Don't be too late. We told each other we loved each other. And, and you never know when that might be the last time. But it was it was good that he said that to us and we said that to him. Then all of a sudden, 2 o'clock, and I want a loud knock on the door. Okay. And now we're talking about the 14th. And uh, it was two policemen. And uh, they asked to come in. They asked us to sit down. And I heard them say that my son had been shot. And uh, I said, what hospital is he in? And they said, no, he's dead. And I, I realized now maybe they probably said that to begin with, but my mind just did not, would not, would not accept that, you know? And uh, my wife screamed, no. And she said, no, he's upstairs in his room. His sister by now has woken up and she's upstairs in, in the same, uh, right down the hall from his bedroom. She runs to his bedroom to see if he's there. And she shouts down, mom, he's not there. And I guess reality started hitting us in the face. And uh, it, I mean, it took days to, to absorb this thing, but uh, God, it's just so devastating at the time, not only losing your son, but then we would later find out even that same night, we asked the police to bring us to the morgue and we had to identify our son. And and uh, we, my wife, for some reason, was hoping that it was the wrong person, uh, uh, you know, and obviously it wasn't. Uh, but also we, we asked the police to drive us by where he had been killed. And I don't think it even still registered to Hob, but it all of a sudden registered to me that this was about drugs. And how could it be that we had missed that, you know? And of course, with hindsight, you look back and you might have seen a couple of things or a couple of things were going on. But, uh, you know, it was it was hard to accept that we didn't get a chance to work with him and find out that he had a, a, an issue. OK, and uh, just a few weeks before he had expressed that he uh, that he had uh, had some depression and you might even say I was a little suspicious of, of, of some maybe simple drug use. Maybe he started smoking pot a little more or something. OK, never would have dreamed that he could have been doing crack. OK, uh, but the uh, uh, he admitted depression and, you know, and I, I said I would help him with that. And uh, we talked about some things that he could do in life and how to retarget his life and. Another gift that was given to us was a couple of days after we had that discussion and still just a few days before his death, he said, dad, I'm glad we had that discussion. You know, you've, you've helped give me some direction and uh, I'm making a to-do list, like you said. And, uh, uh, and he said, I want to let you know that I'm going to focus on this in school now. And I said, well, great, great. You know, and, and, and he said, also, I want to let you know that, you know, I, uh, he let me know, you know, I, I want you to know, I really got great parents. Okay. And uh, so that was a, a gift. And then he said something really strange that disarmed me at the time. He said he wanted to write some poetry and later we would find a lot of poetry and short term uh, things. And he even wrote a poem titled 1201, almost the same time he died, that somewhat shape or form was related to his death. If I get a chance, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll try to read that to you. Okay. But, but in any event, uh, he also said, that he would like to do something to discourage kids from doing drugs. And, 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 you know, in hindsight now, you think back, well, he was kind of 
confession without confession. Okay. In a way, but, but when he said that to me at that time, it, it, I, I thought this kid finally gets it, you know, and, and I don't have to worry about him anymore, <laughs> you know, and then days later, uh, you know, the addiction called him and he could not resist. We would later find out that uh, he had asked a couple of friends to help him not go. And that uh, about 10 or 15 minutes after he left, one of his friends had actually called that night. And at the time, we didn't even realize what that call was. We would later find out that he had called two friends that day and wasn't able to reach either one of them. And one of them missed him by 10 or 15 minutes. And their plan was that they were going to go out and, you know, drink a beer and maybe shoot some pool and get his mom off the cravings. So I know he didn't want to do this. And I know he felt bad about doing this. And it hurts me that he couldn't admit it to me, okay? Uh, but but it helped motivate me, along with the, 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 the idea that, you know, when he dies, I start realizing how good of a kid this was. And, and, and I start understanding addiction to some extent. And I, uh, I realized that, you know, something's got to be done. Something's got to be done. And, and so first off, though, I went to talk to the police thinking that, you know, I, I want to try to help them solve this case. And I, I I went there, you know, and I, I quickly could tell that the stigma it, to, to them, this was another drug deal going bad. OK, and the, the very little bit they did, they messed up. So eventually I had to take it upon myself to do it. And yes, it was a dangerous area. OK, and I knew uh, at that time we said we had originally got angry at God. Yeah, we did. But but then you come back to. You got to have something to hold on to. And, and, and we started renewing our faith and our, and our faith was helping us. And then, you know, I was praying to God, look, help me solve this murder. Help me get this killer off the street. And uh, and uh, so I made that bargain with God, along with what my son had said. I wanted to do something to discourage kids. I made a bargain with God that I would go on a mission. Okay. And I would try to make a dent in the problem. I would try to prevent these tragedies, as, as you would go eloquently stated. So again, we were off on this and we had to walk the streets and we went to the black churches in the area and, uh, and it was predominantly a black area. So we had to befriend people. We had to show them that we cared, show them that we weren't going to quit. And long story short, I guess you might say, we eventually, and if you watch the show, it's really bizarre because at, at one time I befriend his killer thinking his kill is a witness. And uh, he tells me that he's going to help me find the killer. And uh, and it turns out that he is the killer. But uh, I eventually reached the witness, and I used old-type technology. I heard you talking with Ed Bish about old-type technology, okay? Well, we didn't have really computers very much back then. And I, I drew a, a, I took a circumference out and I drew a circle around where my son was killed. And I went out maybe, I don't know, half a mile or whatever, so many blocks. And I uh, got the Haynes directory out and I looked up all the phone numbers in that area. And I made call after call after call. And I had a little spiel. My son was murdered in his red pickup truck, uh, uh, you know, six months ago or nine months ago at the time, I believe it was. And uh, they, some people think the case has been solved because the police had arrested somebody. And uh, that person was in jail the night that uh, my son was killed. So that was impossible. And uh, I said, would you, would you know, would, do you know anything about it? Know of any somebody who might know something about it? And, you know, call after call after call, I had some friendly people, I had some angry people, I had some people hang up, I had some no calls, I had some will call backs. And then I, about the last call of the day, I call and the girl says, yeah, I saw it all. I know the killer. I babysat the killer. She had actually babysat the killer. The killer called her TT, or a short name for like auntie. She wasn't officially his aunt, but she was good friends with the killer's mother. And, you know, and she says, I called Crime Stoppers that night or with the nights of the murder. So, which was really bizarre is, again, all that I had done, the police had this answer from the very beginning. It, 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 it's a nightmare scenario, okay? But any of it, long story short, it took nine months to convince her to come on. And if you listen to the show, there's plenty of times me and her almost parted ways. Okay. Uh, she had promised me she was going to come forward. Okay. And, you know, her faith had a lot to do with this too, though. 
Her father was for it. Her mother was against it. Okay. But really, when she talks about it, my daughter helped out because she had lost a sibling herself. And the case was never solved. And then she saw the hard work we were doing. She got to know my wife. She got to know my daughter. Okay. She got to know me. She almost got aggravated with me because I wouldn't back off. Okay. But eventually she came forward and we got a measure of justice. So now what I got to do. Okay. Now my wife says, you got to take a break. Okay. And I do want to go on my mission now. I want to fulfill my obligation to God. I want to make a difference. Okay. Uh, and uh, I come home from the, from the, the sentencing hearing. The sentencing hearing. Uh, we, we come home and uh, my answer phone's beeping. And it's my son's high school teacher calling and asking if I want to speak at Red Ribbon Week at the schools. And my wife says, no, wait, we were supposed to take a break. How is it that I come home and I get this call the day I come home when a sentence has happened? But on the other hand, so I don't even tell him yes completely because my wife and you know we were just so, through so much. How could I throw myself into speaking at his high school? But we prayed on it that night. And I thought, well, you know, I, I promised God I was going to do this. And here's an opportunity right now. It's Red Ribbon Week, which is where the weeks the, the, the schools all discuss this situation. And we did it. And it, we, we got a claim for it. Okay. And, and, and then I was off and running on my mission. But then the mission became complicated. Okay. Not only was I going to talk in the schools, but now all of a sudden I had a doctor. I'm in a pharmacist in a pharmacy, and I'm seeing young kids come in with Oxycontin. Kids like Ed Bish's son, okay? And and I know they fool with a very, very dangerous drug. I'm a pharmacist. I now know about addiction. I, 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 I'm, I'm tuned in. My brain is highlighted, okay? And I, I can see the problem before it's even happening. And I start seeing these kids having trouble. And one doctor in particular. And so eventually I actually went to the police and I went to the TV stations and all, and I tried to put an end to it without me having to get really deeply involved in the investigation. Cause I'd sort of promised my wife, I wasn't going to do any more investigation. I was only going to speak in schools. Uh, but the necessity was they weren't moving fast enough. They didn't seem, well, I mean, they hadn't lost a kid. Okay. And, and, and they, I guess they thought somebody like me couldn't, couldn't make a difference. Okay. And I, I guess they had to dot all of the I's and cross all the T's. Okay. Well, what I learned is one person can make a difference. I didn't have the same kind of restrictions that they had. Now, I'm not, I'm not letting them off easy now because I think they should have been doing a whole lot more than they was doing, okay? But they don't have the intensity that I had, okay? And they also have some legal restrictions that I didn't have, okay? And so, you know, I was able to tape and video and record and, and you know, uh, uh, and I and I learned to do that when I was working on my son's case. So Just to be careful, when you say they, you're talking about the police establishment. Yes, I'm talking about the DEA, law enforcement. FBI, the law enforcement in general. Mm -hmm. And uh, so actually, I had to take it upon myself to work on shutting her down. And that took about another year and a half. So my, my son's case took a year and a half. And then that one took a year and a half. And I managed to shut down the biggest pill mill operator in, 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 in the state of Louisiana. Congratulations. And, Thank you. Thank you. And, 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 and if you watch the pharmacist and whoever out there hasn't watched it, try to watch it. And there's a little DEA agent or there's a little black lady DEA agent. And she had been trying working behind the scenes and I didn't know everything they were doing, but I knew they were, I didn't know they were involved in an investigation, but they had done a lot of work trying to shut this doctor down. Okay. And she, in the end kind of said, well, you know, we were a little aggravated with him. Okay. But in the end, she said, you know what? You can't argue with results. He got her before we could get her, okay? And so I shut it down probably at least a year before maybe they would have shut it down, which probably saved a bunch of lives. Uh, more than a bunch, I'm sure. But, you know, it didn't end there. You're right. It, it didn't end there. Now, maybe I'm on my mission still, okay? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I did shut her down, but, you know, there are other doctors and uh, uh the problem still exists and uh Purdue Pharma, I learned about Purdue Pharma with their, 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 their drug Oxycontin and their misleading advertisement and the whole nine yards. And, you know, I make phone calls to Purdue to try to get to them to, 
to warn them. I'm naive, uh, sort of like Ed Bish was at one point in time, naive, almost thinking that maybe these people just don't know. And maybe if we can make it clear to them, later we would all find out uh, by listening now to information that's come out. They knew early on that this was a big problem and it was all about money. Okay. But I, I made an effort and just like Ed and a lot of us early on, we didn't really put much of a dent norm in Purdue. And it wasn't until recently that finally, through the efforts of people like Ed and other individuals, individuals who stood up, okay, who, who constantly just didn't let up and didn't give up, stood up, knew what was right from wrong, got dirt kicked in their face constantly, okay, uh, but just would not give up. And eventually we have brought Purdue Former down to his knees. Now, Ed and I would prefer somebody to be in jail. And we're still hoping that happens. But I will say this, their reputation has been destroyed, okay? And they're all going to pay a good chunk of money, okay? Now, unfortunately, they're still going to be fabulously wealthy, okay? And that irks us to no end. But they're going to contribute a, a fairly decent amount of money that is going to help, we hope, remedy uh, the, the situation uh, to try to get treatment and education and prevention and, and again, when I look back at some of the things that this mission has been on, and, I, and I've really plugged into it, I really look back, and, and I guess because of it being on a show that, and on Netflix, a lot of people have told me that I've made a difference. And, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm fortunate in that respect, because th there's a lot of unsung heroes out there that are making a difference. And I guess... I'm sort of lucky. I know it's a really incredible story, but I'm sort of lucky that we got this show and everybody's got to see it. And it's helped me magnify my effect and people have learned from it. And it's motivated some other people to take on the mantle. Okay. E Which even is, if it motivates one person, it's worth it. it. Exactly. It's educated some parents, hopefully. Okay. But it's, it's, it, it's motivated other advocates. Absolutely. Which, you know, again, y y your show called, I like the title of your show with the, uh, you know, the, going after the big guys. Okay. Uh, and uh, notice I don't call them bad guys, the yeah, big guys. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, so, but thank uh, well, you. I appreciate that. Would it be all right if I asked a question or two? Is this a good yeah, time? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the first challenges you faced, uh, I don't like to use the word problem, this we only have challenges. And one of the first challenges you had was the stigma involved in in um in uh, in deaths caused by drugs that and and the automatic assumption that the uh, that the victim uh, was at, at fault. I mean, it, it's similar to um, in rape cases. The police establishment assumes, that if a, a person is raped, that the that the victim is was partly responsible. Okay, right. so 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 it's I, that was you brought up a really really good point, and that is a big challenge, and and people have automatic assumptions already made, and um, but, but whether right or wrong, they have assumptions, and those can be a real real challenge. When I if I can talk just for a moment about my own case, I was trying to show that the levy failures during Hurricane Katrina were not due to us anything local people did or didn't do. Uh, these were mistakes by the federal government. It's it's the feds Absolutely. who build the levies, design and build. And and the moment I tried to say that, people looked at me like I had two heads. Uh, so who am I to fault the almighty United States government when this what happened to us was our fault? So so that's a challenge. But but I, I, our listeners out there, just as I did and just as Dan did, we didn't let that shut us down. We didn't let that stop us. You know, you Absolutely. recognize Absolutely. it and move on. So so uh, with how, how what would you suggest uh, to our listeners? You know, wh what did you do when when faced with the we out with the not we out, not that it wasn't real, but faced with this these automatic stigma and assumptions? Well, <laughs> You got to understand, I did understand stigma because I hate to admit it, I had it myself. I, you know, I, I, I actually, b before my son died, and I, I hate to say this, but, you know, I, I almost thought the same way. And I really didn't even understand addiction, okay? But 
I learned that there's a lot of good people out there that get involved in drugs. Okay. And there's a lot of, it's, it's a much more complex thing that we know. Okay. And stigma is getting in the way of helping these people. Okay. So, so how did I overcome it? Well, geez, I had a high motivation. Okay. Uh, you okay. know, first it was, I, I wasn't going to let any stop me. Okay. It, it, yeah. Stigma was a hurdle, but I was going to get over that. Okay. I, I, I sh shucked off the embarrassment and we had it at first. We almost didn't want to leave the house for the first 30 days after my son's death, almost out of shame. And when I did leave the house, it was only to go into the ninth ward trying to find his killer. Okay. So, but we shut that off and you, you have to overcome that because the only way that you're going to ever accomplish something is, is, is don't let the general thought process stop things. Just like what you said with the, with the, uh, the, the, the levies uh, early on, People like me and Ed Bish early on that were starting to fight this fight, and Dr. Art Van Z. There was people around the country that were trying to do something. And unfortunately, we didn't know each other. Okay. I think maybe had we known each other and we could have got together a little more so, maybe it could have made a difference. But we were faced too with being stigmatized for fighting for the cause. Wow. And, and, and you know, I hate to say it, if I wouldn't have lost my son, maybe it would have been difficult to overcome that stigma. But I had to do it. I was on a mission. You know, I, I had to do something and I had to overcome that. And so perhaps uh, one of the things you did was you educated people that it wasn't wasn't the, the it isn't the, the child. It's the drug. Absolutely. And it's addiction. And and the way Oxycontin changes your brain. Absolutely. And, and, and you can, and you can stop taking it, but your brain st st hasn't changed. Your, your brain, brain has been damaged. changed by the drug Hijacked. and just stopping taking it d d doesn't change your brain back. To, to Abs you're absolutely right. And that's the case with the most of the people that die. They, they have had their brains altered. Now we do have the situation and we want to mention that there is this one pill kill thing out there right now mm -hmm. where maybe these kids haven't had their brains changed yet. Okay. Maybe they or don't really have an addiction and, and, and yet they're giving pills. Even, even Ed's son was early on novice. Probably we, we don't know for a fact that he truly had an addiction. Okay. And now with fentanyl, now these they're making fake pills now. Mm. You you've got kids that go on social media, okay, and they'll buy what they think is a Xanax. Now, granted, I'm not saying these kids are angels, okay, because they shouldn't be taking a prescription drug uh, off the internet, okay. But you know, kids the past five years or, or earlier, or five or ten years ago, they were doing this, and there was almost no harm. It, it might have led some eventually to uh, uh, addiction, okay? But most of them tried it. It was a lock and it was over with. Well, a lot of them are dying now. So we we, wow. we have to mention that there's two areas that's going on now. Now, the biggest area is people who really have had their brains changed and they just cannot resist. Mm -hmm. they, it's, many of them even find out about fentanyl and realize the risk. But it's like, to give you an example, you know, they really don't have control anymore. Almost, they, they can't right. see the danger. Uh, they, it's like a survival. It's almost like a, a, uh, they, they're fighting for their life to get that drug. And it's the only thing that matters. It's the only thing that matters. And so, uh, yeah, uh, somebody's got to stand up for these people. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and, and you the, did. And yeah. Mr. Ed Bish, uh, uh, Bish, the, those of you who aren't familiar who Ed Bish is, um, I interviewed uh, Ed Bish on this um, podcast in a in a previous episode till today, and I welcome you to check that out as well. Um, I, I, you, you brought something up that I, I think our listeners should take note. You reached a point where you you felt you needed to take a break. Yes. And you and if you felt you needed to take a break, it's good that you did. And 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 those of you out there who've taken on the big guys, I mean, I, I took on the big guys 17 years ago and there were times when I took a break and you can always go back to it just as you went back to it when you had the calling, which for you is literally a call, literally yes. a phone call. But when when you need to go back, you can. And one of the one of the beautiful things about starting a movement, which begins with one person, is that thing that you've created doesn't just 
poof disappear overnight just because you've decided to take a break. Uh, you it, it'll still be there when when you need it. And and um, also this is I, I, you, you mentioned something that I think is so important to all of our listeners and the difference between me when I took on my cause and Dan with his cause and Ed with his cause is we're not just checking, uh, punching a time clock and going home at night. We're living this yes. cause. We're living our mission. We're living this. Whereas the the big guys that you're you're trying to um, overcome or trying to stop exploiting you or trying to stop killing people, they're on a time clock. It, yeah. For them, it's just the paycheck. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, Foss, you're right. Me and Ed never made a nickel doing this. Okay. And uh, the, uh, the, the hours that you put in, but you know, it, it's in our heart. It's in our heart. Now, I will tell you a, a, a little brief story about how this can motivate others to do something. I went uh, shortly after the pharmacist broke on Netflix, I went to a Mardi Gras parade and a guy walked up to me and says, Hey, are you the pharmacist? He actually recognized me from the show. And I said, yeah, I am. He says, I got to tell you something. You changed my life. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, he says, I tell you, I work for this company and they sell uh, medical uh, supplies, equipment. Okay. And they sell like joints uh, for like show uh, for hips and, and, you know, uh, those type of, those type of things. And he, and he said, you know, it, it's a sad thing. He says, but in my office now, we, we, we sell a bunch of different joints. He says, some of them got a 90% success ratio. Some got 95. Okay. He says, but you know, they pay us three times as much to sell the, the ones that work the worst. And, and I hate to say that, but that, that happens. That, that's where greed comes in, or you want to call it the big guys. You might not call it, but sometimes it's the bad guys, okay, or people with their heads screwed up with money. Yeah, they there's reverse incentives in our system, okay? There was reverse incentive in for, for Purdue, for Purdue Pharma, okay? You know, rather either be honest or make money, okay? Wow. Well, wow. And, and, and motivate your sales force. Mislead your sales force, motivate your sales force, lie to your sales force. Well, this guy said he went in the next day, okay, and he said, he says, hey, I'm not going to sell that thing no matter what, he says, okay. And he, and he basically said that he wasn't, he was almost ready to give in, start selling the one. Now, now, now in all fairness to him now, remember, one of the joints is maybe like 85%. And the other one's 95%. So most of the time it works. So the guys that were selling it for three times the money, but you realize what it takes to remove a joint out of somebody and put a new one back in. My you know, husband had a hip replacement six weeks ago. So I'm actually very educated on that subject. As a matter of fact, major well, stuff. He just thought it was wrong. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's what you've got to see. You thought the levees were wrong. I, I, I thought people looking at addiction wrong. I thought this doctor was killing people. I thought the police wasn't working my son's case, okay? And you, 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 when you see wrong, do what you can do to make it right, okay? Do the right thing no matter what it costs. Amen. Okay? So, absolutely. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I, like, I like to read briefly my son's poem. Please. I want to tell you this poem, a little something about this too now. I eventually had befriended my son's killer before I knew he was his killer. Okay. And uh, after I found out he was his killer, I was introduced to a man who, and I was trying to decide. When the witness told me this kid that I thought was on my side, when he told me he was the killer, I, I really felt betrayed. And I almost didn't want to believe the witness. Is, is honest as she was, and I eventually became to totally believe her. But in early on, I didn't. And I, I was told to go speak to this, uh, uh, so it's kind of a funny story, a retired drug dealer who was going to let me know uh, on the street who actually killed my son. I was trying to verify who actually killed my son. Okay, And during the course of the conversation, he says, after I found out who the killer was, do you want me to have him killed? That's right. Wow. Yeah, you know, I hope nobody else that wow. tries to take on the big guys, it, it's a life and death situation. It usually isn't, okay? Maybe you don't go as far as I went if you watch the pharmacist, okay? But you can do your part somewhere along the line to stand up, say something, write something, do something, okay? Words but, to live by. 
but any event, I, I decided not to kill him because believe it or not, I actually thought about it. It's sad to say. I, I, I have three children and I, and I, I am not being judgmental at this moment for how you felt. Well, you, you got to understand now, I still had a chance that the witness could be killed. I could be killed. I also had a chance that even if we got it to a trial, this kid would walk. And I knew he was the killer. So in some sense, if I didn't, he might kill somebody else. So, you know, in, in a crazy sort of way, I'm not saying it's right. You can almost justify it. And I wouldn't have had to pull the trigger. But any event, I said no. And this is why I said no. My son, about five years before he died, when he was like 17 in high school, wrote a poem. And I had some discussions with him. He was against the death penalty. Believe it or not, his dad was for the death penalty. He's finally won the argument. I'm against the death penalty now. Okay. And I, I, I'm not trying to be political here or anything. Everybody's entitled to an opinion. I had my own opinion at one time, but my son won my heart. But this tells you a little bit about my son's heart. And it also tells you something a little bit about what happened to him that night. It's titled 12.01 a.m. Remember, he died at 12.08 officially, but he died sometime before that. It, it goes, wrong turn. It's like a mystery story. Light burns. As Stephen King writes down his words of glory, critics rave. The body of a killer will be placed in his long-awaited grave. The parents of his victim are charged a high price of admission to watch his pain, but their satisfaction is guaranteed, so everyone claims. A flip of the switch in the dark of the night, a cry in the distance, a life taken for spite. The day turns black, the light is gone, new killers are born. A director now awaits approval to wrote a blockbuster hit. But in life, this story just doesn't fit, or does it? It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. It's unbelievable. But uh, it, in so many ways, um, um, he, he was a, real, a true poet, and there, were way, there are far fewer real poets in the world than people may think. He was a true poet. And it, it was a gift that he left us. It, it also motivated me, and it may have saved my son's killer's life, and maybe mine. Uh, okay. And, 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 you know, he also wrote poems about God. Okay. And, and so he helped me, my son helped me after. Okay. And his words to just do something to discourage kids. Okay. So I, I hope we can motivate people who don't have to have this kind of problem happen to them. Okay. Because you can do your part. Okay. Uh, the public can do that part. You, you can notice things that aren't, and you can bring them to attention. You can write up eds in the paper. You can, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know completely your story, but I bet you did some digging on this thing. Oh, and, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, I and, and, and you were, and, 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 and you, you, you probably had some impact on, on the, the ultimate outcome. Uh, I... and, and, and if not, the effort is worth it. Yes. If you're doing what's right, even if you don't succeed, the effort is working, okay? You, you, for, the, for our listeners, you don't have to lead like I led and like um, Dan led, but you can contribute a skill that you're good at. Uh, maybe you're good at copywriting, or maybe you're good at art, art and drawing. Uh, maybe you're an attorney. Uh, you can contribute your skills and Absolutely. to help. Yeah. I agree with you completely. So uh, is there anything else you'd like to share um, with our listeners um, that you feel you've got to tell them before we, we finish up? Yeah, I, I do because it's, it's kind of like my latest mission, you know, I go from mission to mission and, you know, I tire sometime I take breaks and you're right. Sometimes you got to take breaks. You've got family. I'm now 72 years of age now too. So, you know, you start wondering how, how much time and effort can I continue to put into this? Okay. So I got to take breaks sometime. But, you know, I have focused on something more recently, and it's called MAT, which is Medically Assisted Treatment for Addiction. And believe it or not, I wasn't always for it because it's you, you give them a drug that's kind of like a partial opioid, okay, and it kind of uh, st stimulates the brain in certain ways that prevents cravings and prevents uh, withdrawals, okay, it really doesn't get them high, okay, and what a lot of people can do is they can get on this and they can kind of moderate uh, they don't go out drug seeking okay so it's it's a treatment okay and it, it's also a harm reduction because if they take in this drug it's a safe legal drug okay but there's a stigma associated with it because most people simply say 
Well, you're swapping one drug for another, you're still an addict, okay? But an addict is a person who drug seeks, okay, uh, and, 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 and loses control of his life, okay, and maybe doesn't raise his kids. People that get on MAT can actually raise their kids. And I, I, if, if, if you want a little bit more of a description of that, Ed mentioned, and I'll mention it, the movie Dope Sick on Hulu, okay? It, it, it's, a, I think, an eight-part series. Michael Keaton's the actor, okay? It's a great show that defines to you addiction. It kind of, the guy that actually produced this thing, a boy named Danny Strong from out in California, he actually watched the pharmacist first, and it helped motivate him to do this. And he carried it to the next level. Now, nothing to do with losing my son, but he carried the Purdue thing and the Purdue story uh, to a much greater level. But he also brought out MAT on how it saves people's lives and how we got to remove the stigma. So I I'm trying now, uh, and hopefully maybe one of my final missions, okay, and, uh, to, to make a difference with MAT. Overdose deaths have climbed to 107,000. When my son died, Okay, overdose was sixteen thousand. Wow. So it 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 it's been a nightmare for me in a sense because with all I did, sometimes I say, did I really accomplish something? Now, enough people have told me that I know maybe it'd been worse. And not only that, I'm only one person. Okay, and yeah, you do make a difference. It could be worse. You, I have saved some lives. Okay, and I know that now because of the show. People have told me situations where I have. Okay. Uh, but hey, I want to give it one more effort. I hopefully I can be a little bit of a part, a little bit of a spark to try to get this MAT off the ground. I think it's the only way we can significantly reduce this because a lot of people aren't getting treatment, and uh, and 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 there's a stigma involved in treatment, and there's a stigma involved in MAT, and so we got another hurdle to overcome, but we're still going to work at it. And we're still going to work on it. And you've got me as your uh, follower. Uh, I I'm going to get behind this uh, this new treatment because uh, I have watched the series Dope Sick and I do understand why it's needed. And you can count on me. Great. I really <laughs> appreciate it. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Anything else you've got to ask me, I'm, I'm open. Well, I might invite you to come on my show again soon. All right. That's a good idea. Thank you so much, Dan. And thank you all of you for listening to this episode. I hope that you've enjoyed this episode as well as all the others on Beat the Big Guys. And remember, no matter who you are, you too can beat the big guys. And God bless. Stay with me. I just have to stop recording. Sure.